<laughs> hey everybody, what's going on? I am here with the one and only Monica Crowley, aka my sister. <laughs> yes. Monica. Terrence. I love you. Oh my I god. I love you, Monica. Right back at you, my friend. How I, are you doing? I am so good and I am so happy to be with you. Congratulations Thank on this you. new show. It's absolutely phenomenal. Thank you. And I'm so honored to be one of your very first guests. Yes, it is a pleasure. So thank you for taking out the time, Monica. So how you been doing? I am so good. And uh, you know what? I'm even better now that I'm in, first of all, with you. But secondly, thank you. in Florida. The great, the great state of Florida. The great state of Florida. Now, Monica, tell me, how am I supposed to sleep at night when Joe Biden is the president? <laughs> Please explain to me. I, I'm, I'm up all night. I can't sleep. I'm sweating. I, I, I'm tur tossing and turning because this country is just in shambles. How, how am I supposed to sleep? How have you been sleeping the last two years? Pretty badly, right? Pretty, pretty badly. Yeah, yeah, I know. Me too. There are literally things that keep yes. me up at night, li literally up at night where I'm staring at the ceiling going... <gasps> Like the vibe has been so bad. And I, I just want to tell the audience, Terrence yes. is my wonderful, wonderful friend. And when I was serving in the Trump administration, I was serving as assistant secretary of the treasury. Yes. And I invited Terrence yes. to join oh. me at treasury for lunch. And we just had an amazing time. Actually, you know what? I, I like, I have to thank you for that because that was my first time being at the Department of Treasury. I, I, and when I went to the Treasury, I said, I'm about to get some money. <laughs> I said, I'm about to go up here and get paid, baby. I've been at the Department of Treasury. I was walking around looking for dollar bills and people were like, who are, you, who, who are you supposed to be here with? Well, Monica, but I was looking for money. I mean, Monica... <laughs> Like, how did you, how do you even get a job like that? Like, what quality, like, how did you get that job? I have to say, tell the audience, it is true that when Terrence was with, with me at Treasury, yes. I lost track of him for about 15 <laughs> minutes, and he was down at the vault. Looking for the Benjamins, baby. Is, yeah, he, was, he was in the vault in the basement of the Treasury Department. I didn't know how to act. But, like, <laughs> no, how, did, how, do you, how do you get a job like that? Like, 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 what has to be on your resume to get a job at the department? Department of Treasury. Well, and and we're going to get back to how we sleep at night under Joe Biden. Yes, I, I was I was sort of segueing into the Trump administration. Okay, sure, okay. Because you know the contrast between President Trump's extraordinary policies that yes. delivered a booming economy and world peace. Yes, I mean I don't know what else people expect from an American exactly. president: a booming economy. And world peace. What else do you expect from anybody holding that office? But we'll get back to that. So the contrast is so stark, yes. right? Because now we have neither. We have an economy that is faltering and we could slide back into recession this year. And we've got conflicts all over the place where exactly. America's worst enemies are taking advantage of us. We can get to that, back to that in a second, but to answer yes. your question about Treasury, I'm just kidding about Terrence in the vault. <laughs> but in the next I Trump the administration- FBI, I don't want the FBI raiding my house <laughs> looking for those Benjamins, baby. <laughs> I'll tell you, in the next Trump administration, we're, we are going to go raid that yes. vault, you and me, okay? Um, you know, I had been President Trump's very first supporter publicly, you you know, yes. outside of his family and his friends. And it was about, I love telling this story because it's an amazing story. So about, I don't know, 72 hours after he came down the escalator in June of 2015, I'm on Fox News and I was on with Bill O'Reilly. And then I think the next morning with Don Imus. So we're talking about like the most hard-nosed, toughest sons of guns you'll ever deal with, right? right? And Trump had announced a couple of days before, and I remember being on live TV with Bill O'Reilly, and he was having a hearty chuckle about the whole thing. Yeah. He was like, oh, man. He's like, I've known Donald J. Trump for, you know, 40 years or whatever. This is a vanity play. <laughs> He's going to last two weeks. Yeah. It, this is just- A lot of people say you know, that, right? Right. A yeah. lot of people. And I was like, I was not laughing with him at all. And I looked at him, and I said, stop laughing. Do not underestimate him. He's going to pull the whole thing off. So you were one of the ones they called crazy when uh, Trump oh, first ran. I can't even tell you how many like slings and arrows I took yes. early on with people like, oh, you cannot be serious. And I was like, I I'm 100% serious. So Donald Trump saw that. 
Yeah. He saw that interview, and during that entire campaign, like every time I'd see him on the campaign trail, you know, he'd give me a shout out uh-huh. or a kiss on the forehead, and he would say, Monica, when everybody else was making fun of me, mocking me, uh, you know, dismissing the whole thing, he said, you got it, you saw it, you stuck by me through thick and thin, and you're coming with me all the way. Oh, wow. So when the time came, I, and this position op- opened up at Treasury, um, I do have a PhD in national security not economics, but I've also had quite an extensive career in media. Uh And so I was basically working on the economic messaging for the Treasury Secretary, the Treasury Department, and the administration writ large. So it was all about economic communications to the rest of the country about all the good that President Trump was doing on the economy. So you were qualified. I think so. No, you were qualified. I hope so. You were qualified. Yeah. Yes. So, okay, now let's let's go back to 2015. When everyone was when everyone was saying, "Oh, you have to be crazy to think that President Trump is going to win." You have to be crazy. And when people thought it was just a it was just a, a stunt. What like what was it about Trump that made you believe that he was the one that was going to get this country back on track, that he was the one that would make this country great again. What made you think that Trump was going to win? Great question. So I knew him a little bit, not well, just by being in New York and our paths had crossed here and there. But when I saw him come forward um, with that announcement and then the day or so later when he started shooting from the hip, Yes. About the border in particular, where he said they're not sending their best. They're sending rapists and murderers <laughs> yeah. and drug dealers. Oh, they were and, mad and about that one. It. Yeah. And I, it just hit me. And I thought, OK, after eight years of Barack Obama, the country is really in a bad place. So the country is different. The Republican Party is different. And the Republican base is different. And what I saw in Donald Trump was the blue collar billionaire, somebody who was not beholden to anyone, not special interest, nobody, and did not give a flying wit what the mainstream or propaganda press had to say about him. He was going to go out there and say, we have no time to waste. Mm -hmm. This country is hanging by a thread and I'm going to call it like I see it. And when I saw him do that, I said, what, I, it, my head went on a swi- swivel. Right. And I said, no more establishment tools running for the GOP nomination. And they, they were all like, I mean, these are very decent people. A lot of them are my friends. A lot yeah. of them are probably going to run again this time. But I will tell you, Trump was the disruptor that we needed. Yes. We could not continue on the same trajectory exactly. or we were going to lose our country. And when he started telling the truth about the economy, about the border, about crime, about all of these issues, the American people just their heads turned around and they said, this is what we need. And one final point about this. Um, you know, I was with him throughout that 2016 campaign, yes. um, with him throughout his administration, sometimes literally, you know, and, yes. and literally during his time in, in office. And, you know, they threw everything at him to try to stop him. And I'm happy to talk about this, too, because they continue yes. to do it, Terrence. He is an existential threat to the entire corrupt regime. That is the deep state the permanent bureaucracy, the propaganda press, uh, the international community, the transnational organizations like the World Economic Forum and the World Health Organization that are trying to get a one world government. He was the disruptor, the single man who stood up and said, no, America first and Americans first. Right. Hugely powerful message to the American people. It resonated, Terrence, in an emotional way, an emotional uh, and, and that's why he was able to create an emotional bond with the American people, not a political bond, right. not an intellectual bond, an emotional one. It was time for a real change. A- absolutely. It was time and, for a real change. You know, yep. Barack Obama, that was his slogan, right? Time for a change, change this, change hope that. Hope and change. Yeah, hope and change. There was no change. Right. There was no change at all. And Trump brought the real change to America and that's why we love him so much. So you didn't think Jeb Bush was going to do this? <laughs> <laughs> no, you didn't, you didn't I think, 
should not. You didn't think Jeb Bush was going to stand up for the American people? I did not. <laughs> no, and you know, all of these dynasties, yes. right? The Kennedy dynasty, the Bush dynasty, the Clinton dynasty, yeah. it, it's enough. And if we're going to save this country, you know, this is why we need disruptors like Donald Trump. Exactly. Right? Now, now, back in, so you, so what did, uh, now at that time, a lot of people said that the women should be voting for Hillary Clinton. All right. Now, did you get anybody that did you have anybody in your family, any friends? Hopefully you don't have no friends that told you to vote for Hillary Clinton. <laughs> oh, nobody told me to vote for <laughs> anybody. No, I, everybody around me knows where I'm coming okay. from. I do this for a living. I'm on camera yeah. and, and my podcast and so on. So now everybody, every nobody dares tell me and, and who to vote for. All these people that you just mentioned that were against Trump, they are still against Trump. They are still trying to stop him because he is running in 2024. Yes. He's running now. Yes. He's campaigning now. He, yes, he is. And how how do you feel about that? How do you feel about President Trump running Well, to your for, first point about how everybody continues to try to stop him, the reason why is because Donald Trump is an existential threat to the entire corrupt ruling class. Every group that I laid out, the deep state, propaganda yes. press, permanent bureaucracy, they are deeply entrenched in Washington and deeply, deeply corrupt. So they cannot allow Donald Trump to succeed. Remember in 2016, he caught them flat-footed. It You're was right. supposed to be Hillary, right? It was supposed to be Hillary. Yeah, absolutely, because it was supposed to be eight years of Obama with this great reset which is basically a Marxist socialist revolution here at home. It was supposed to be eight years of Obama and then eight years of Hillary to lock it all in. So when Trump comes out of nowhere and wins in 2016, they vowed never again. They were not going to allow this happen to happen again. And that's why you saw what you saw in 2020, yes. which is uh, an unknown virus sweeping the world. Um, uh, talk about a vaccine. Right. Okay, fear. Fear is the government favorite weapon because it's it's they the bank most on fear. effective weapon they bank on fear and they use it and they make stuff up just to leverage fear against you right so uh, they they realize that's it plus in 2020 antifa blm they they burned down the country anything to stop donald trump exactly. and what he represents so right? what do you say to the people and i've been hearing this all over the internet Trump, they, they say Trump shouldn't run because they, they say they won't let him win. That's what I'm hearing. Trump shouldn't won. Uh, uh, Trump, Trump shouldn't run because they say he's too polarized and that the media won't let him win. The deep state won't let him win. So we should choose somebody else. What do you say to those people who say that? So just to be clear, okay, the deep state, the left, these transnational organizations, they've made so much progress under Obama, and then they feel that they lost four years under Donald Trump, which is why under Joe Biden, whom they also control, mm -hmm. this is Obama's third term, right? So yeah. it's Barack and Michelle, and that whole team <laughs> are running the country this right now. This is literally Barack Obama's third term. Correct. He is running things. Joe Biden is not running a damn thing. He's Biden, not calling the shots. No, Biden is a puppet, and here's how you know. Susan Rice is in the Biden White House and she's their conduit into the Biden White House. So they're running everything. They, this is why you're seeing so much destruction so fast right. under Biden because they feel like they lost four years under Trump, okay, for their grand project. Mm -hmm. So to your question, they are not going to let him win again. This is a very serious issue, yeah. but it's not limited to Donald Trump, okay? He is the most threatening to them. OK, as we've seen over the last six years, but no matter whom the Republicans nominate, whether it's DJT or Ron DeSantis or Mike Pompeo, whomever the Republicans nominate, they are going to throw the kitchen sink at that person to stop them. Exactly. So my argument to everybody is like, well, I'm not so sure about Trump this next time and he's polarizing or whatever. You better go with somebody who has been through the fire before 
who knows what the deep state is all about, who can anticipate the lines of attack coming at them because the deep state, as we saw with the Russia hoax, is literally just make stuff up out of whole cloth and then blindsides you with it. So you better have a candidate who's been through the fire, knows what's coming, knows the nature of the deep state. To me, that's Donald Trump. I mean, we've got a lot of very smart people out there. That's and, a good point. And it, we'll see how it shakes out in the primaries, okay? But you better have somebody who's ready for what's coming at them because it's not going to be pretty. Exactly. And you know what? They will they will love... This, and I believe this. So you made a good point. And that is exactly why they want to get Trump out now. This is why they want... Uh, they, Oh, you guys, you, you don't want Trump because they they, they, they they won't let him win. They want to get Trump out early. They want us to give up on Trump. They want us to throw him away. And so the next Republican who does not know how to fight them, they can get rid of them. I mean, that's going to be easy. Much game easier. Them. It's going to yes. be much easier. Yes. And look, because, under, yes, it's going to be much easier. Understand all of these other potential Republican candidates are really smart and really tough. Governor DeSantis, Mike Pompeo. OK, they, they've been around the block, but nobody is prepared for a deep state attack exactly. of something completely made up that you have no idea about. I mean, you can vet your past and say, oh gosh, you know, when I was 25, I paid my taxes late, they may raise that. No, the deep state comes at you, like with the Russia hoax, with something that is global, that is something that where, where you've got the spooks, uh, you know, running the, the running point on it, and you've got the propaganda press amplifying it. And the next thing you know, you are on your knees. So you better have somebody who's been through this line of fire before right. and who's ready for it. Right. I totally agree. Trump is prepared to fight the deep state. Prepared. And they know that. He's doing it every day. They, they, they know it. I mean, look at all the things that he went through when he was the president. Look at yeah. all the things he went through. All all these, uh, 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 the Russia hoax. What else did he go through? Russia hoax, two fake impeachments. Two fake impeachments. Um, the and election, he never gave up. The election, which was rigged against him, January 6th and the January 6th committee, all of these things like the Mueller investigation, the J6 committee, those things are the actual cover-up of the Fed's crimes. Exactly. Okay, so Donald Trump, and to this day, now he's got a special counsel on him over the documents at Mar-a-Lago and everything else. He has literally been fighting the deep state now for six years. Yes. He knows how to do it, okay? And he knows how to push back. And I'm just afraid, look, it, it, the country is hanging on the precipice of totally losing our freedoms here for good and the Constitution for good. You cannot send a baby deer into a crossfire <laughs> hurricane, right. Right. okay? Yeah. You cannot send a fawn <laughs> right. into a cr crossfire right. hurricane. You better go with someone really tough who's ready exactly. to stand up. And that's why I am voting for President Trump. That's why he has my support. I believe he's the only one that can fight the deep state. He's the only one that is prepared and that's exactly why they want to get rid of him now. They already started. I mean, even before he announced, they were still going after him. They removed him from social media. They they banned him from they banned him from Twitter. They had banned him from Facebook. They banned him from Instagram. Uh, you were not allowed to. Uh, YouTube did not allow people to post interviews of Trump. They took they took him off of social media, Th and they, they were did. still going after him, even though they. Silenced him. They were still going. They were still going after him because they because they knew that the dragon was coming back. Well, that the listen. dragon was coming from out of the den, and he was gonna <laughs> <laughs> he was gonna make a hell for him. Absolutely, yes, exactly. And, and you know what? Too, they have thrown the kitchen sink at this man for six years. So the fact that he is still standing is an absolute miracle. And it's a testament to his personal strength, his fortitude, his faith, all of it. You know, there's there's a bit of hand of God on yes. this whole thing. Right? I believe so. And I, I do believe this is a spiritual battle. It is a spiritual battle. It's There's something bigger going on here than Terrence and Monica or Donald Trump yeah. versus the deep state. There's something bigger going on here. And we all better be wise to it, right? right. A lot of demons making themselves known. A lot of them. So I have a question. So Kamala Harris is the first Speaking female. Of no, oh, no, I didn't Kamala say that. Harris is the first female. <laughs> 
female vice president. How did you feel about that? Were you happy that we had a first female vice president? I do not engage <laughs> in identity <laughs> politics, Terrence, at all. So no, you, you, I, I you weren't happy less. for Kamala? I, I could care less <laughs> who, is, like, what gender, race, whatever. My loyalty, first of all, my loyalty is to God. Amen. And then my loyalty, of course, is my family, who I love, and my dear friends. But my country... I, that's where my loyalty lies with America, with the United States of America and the greatest experiment in human liberty that's ever been, right? Yeah. That's where my loyalty is. So if you are going to stand up and champion this country, individual liberty, economic freedom, strong national defense, and America first, I don't care what gender right. or race you are. I don't care where you're coming from. If you're coming from outer space and you become <laughs> an American citizen <laughs> legally, right. Um, um, you know, whatever it takes. So no, come no, I was not throwing a party for the first so, female. So you say uh, you don't president. care if they come from outer space. <laughs> If they put well, America first, you're gonna support them. I, I, yes, but I think if you <laughs> so these aliens outer space, that are in these UFOs. Yeah. If they come down and run for office. <laughs> well, and they, they, they gonna... can't run for president because you have to be born here for that. So they can't be president. But if you are if you come from wherever yeah. and you you come to the United States legally yeah. um, and you put America first, I'm all for you. I it Just don't break our laws to get here and respect our country and the founding fathers and what the miraculous, extraordinary thing that they've built yes. for subsequent generations like us. Fight for it. Fight for it, I, exactly. I am so so nothing infuriates me more, Terrence, yeah. than people who take this country for granted, who just believe the diet of lies that they're fed every day by the propaganda press, and they don't stand up and fight for this great country. This is the greatest country in the world. People have it good here. People have it great in this country, Monica. I know. And, and, oh, well, oh, well, well I, I, don't, I don't have much money. Go to another country. They're doing way worse than you. Being poor and being poor in Cuba is different than being poor in America. You're poor is different because to them you're rich. You know why? Because America is the greatest is the greatest country. You can get food stamps. You can get government assistance. You can get Section Eight. You can get all all of these things. You, you get can all, get, you get all, all these reassignment ends. surgery. Gender all, reassignment all, surgery. All on our taxpayer money. All on taxpayer money. Right. And then you spit on this country. This is the greatest country in the world. And the greatest thing about this country is the greatest thing about America is if you don't like it here, you don't have to be here. Right. Seriously. If you listen, I love America. I don't love the people that's running this country. Well, ruining in this country. Yes. And they're but doing it all. On exactly. Purpose. But if you do not like America, if you do not love this country, if you think this is the worst place, America's a free country. You are free to leave. Free to go. Seriously. Yeah. By the way, I'm still waiting for Barbara Streisand to leave. Oh, we'll be too. <laughs> we'll be too. We'll be was supposed think... to be gone. <laughs> Whoopi was supposed to be gone, but she's still here eating double whoppers. She's supposed to be gone. I think, I think they first said that when George W. Bush was running for re-election. Yeah. And I think in 2004, and they were like, oh, man, if he gets re-elected, I'm out of here. I'm going to bounce to Canada, right? Right. They're still here. And then the Trump thing, oh, if he's re-elected or if he's elected, I'm gone. They're still here. Why? Because America is the greatest Because America is the greatest country. But we have to fight for it. Exactly. But speaking of presidents, you used to work for Richard Nixon, right? I, I did. I worked with former president Richard Nixon, not when he was president. I was not born then. Um, oh. During the last years of his life. Okay. So in the mid-1990s. It, it was my first job out of college. So, like, how did you get that job? How do you get a uh, job with Richard Nixon? I love the story, so thank you for <laughs> yes. asking. So I was a junior at Colgate, and I was majoring in political science, and I was taking all of the normal courses, like the presidency, Congress, yada, yada. And for the spring of my junior year, I saw on the syllabus a brand new course called National Security to be taught by a new professor. And I said, oh. That's interesting. So I took the course, loved the material so much, Terrence, American foreign policy, national security, the, that I thought, okay, I want to build a career out of this. How yes. do I do that? So I went to the professor. I was like the only conservative kid on the campus, and he was like the only conservative professor on the campus. Okay. <laughs> so he became my mentor. And I said, how do I build a career out of this? 
So he got up, he went to his bookcase and he pulled down four books mm -hmm. and he handed them to me. And he said, when you go home this summer before your senior year, read these books. And when you come back, we'll talk about what you learn from them and how to build a career out of it. And I said, great. So that summer I'm home at my mom's and I take the first book, which was the thinnest book because mm -hmm. my brain was tired after a year in college. Right. So I took the, the skinniest book and it was a book by President Nixon. Wow. He used to write a new foreign policy book every two years. So this was his latest one at the time. And I read it and it absolutely blew me away. So much so that I sat down and I wrote him a letter. So I, I was nothing. I was a college kid with no money, no connections, no nothing. But I sat down and I wrote the former president of the United yeah. States a letter about the issues that he raised in the book. I mailed it. I actually mailed two copies, one to his publisher uh -huh. and one to him care of his local post office. And do you know, Terrence, yeah. he got both copies. This is hand of God. This is what I mean. God puts you exactly yes. where you need to be at exactly the right time. So about a month later, I'm getting ready to go back to college. <laughs> yeah. And I go to my mom's mailbox and I take out this beautiful stationery. Uh -huh. And it's a handwritten note from Richard Nixon to me, thanking wow. me for my letter wow. and inviting me to come in and talk to him in northern New Jersey. You know, what, was, what was going through your mind? I, I remember sitting on, <laughs> on the bed in the bedroom I grew up in, in my mom's house, yeah. right? And I'm getting ready to go back for my senior year. And I started to shake holding that letter because he hand wrote it to me. Yeah. And he wrote, Dear Miss Crowley, I want, I want to thank you for your very thoughtful and comprehensive letter of July 19th. And then he said, you know how the real world works. Wow. And then please contact my office after Labor Day. We'll set up a mutually convenient time. And so I, I did. I went down. Uh, I came down from upstate New York where I was in college to see him in Northern yeah. New Jersey. And he gave me an hour and a half of his time talking to me about politics, foreign policy, a, a little political yeah. gossip. And we just clicked and hit it off. So when I graduated the following May, that's when he offered me a job. And I wow. ended up working with him for the last four years of his life. Wow. I know when you sent that letter, you were probably thinking... He's probably not going to get this letter. Absolutely. I forgot about <laughs> like, it. Yeah. I totally He's not going to get it. this letter. Like, So what did your parents say at that time? Well, my parents were divorced. Okay. Um, and I was with my mom. And she, when she came home from work that day, I'm holding <laughs> yeah. this letter, handwritten letter. From, and I said, Mom, you're not going to believe this. She's like, what? And I said, remember that letter I sent to President Nixon? And she yeah. said, yeah. And I said, he wrote back oh, wow. <laughs> and I handed her the letter. I now have it mounted and framed okay. in my home and it's my most prized possession, along with a picture of me standing between Richard Nixon and Ronald Reagan with my wow. arm around both of them. Wow, yeah. that's amazing. So you still have the letter? Of course. So you yes. haven't put it on eBay yet? No, I have not. <laughs> and in fact, I have massive amounts of material. I've never really talked about this wow. before. You're getting an exclusive. I have massive amounts of material um everything president nixon like wrote to me like yes. he would he would read the new york times because he had to not because he wanted to right and he would like rip out different articles and op-eds and things and he'd take his pen and he would write m for monica you know please read this let's discuss wow. and he'd leave it on my desk in the, in the office and so i'd take it and then we'd talk about it i have every shred of paper that he wow. wrote on to me. You still have so all I of have that. So I have like, yeah, massive volumes. You still have all of that. I have all you, of it. You, and you still got it. I still have it. You know what? In this Biden economy, if somebody had what you had, they probably would have sold it because they're doing really, people are doing really bad right well, now. you know what, Terrence? They would, if, they if, would have auctioned that off because of Biden. <laughs> well, you know what? If the Biden economy continues like this, I might have to auction it off. <laughs> 1999. <laughs> Ripped out paper from Lincoln. Yeah. I, I mean, uh, not from Lincoln. I say Lincoln. Nixon. 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 Now, yep. Yeah. You, and I know you haven't met Lincoln. <laughs> I, I have not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, I think Nancy Pelosi met, met Lincoln. Definitely. I think she, she was probably around when De Lincoln definitely. was around. Yes. I think she tried to impeach Joe Nick, Biden, uh, too. Lincoln. Yeah, Joe Biden, too. Diane Feinstein. I mean, that's, a, that's, I mean, that's just amazing. Like, that's amazing. So what do you think Richard Nixon would think about President Trump? Oh, I, first hold of on, all. Hold on, hold on, hold yep. on. What do you think 
President Nixon would think about President Trump? It's a great question, Terrence. Thank you. And, I, you know, I've been so blessed in my life and all glory to, to God on this. I um, have been very blessed to, to have now worked for two American presidents, Richard Nixon and Donald Trump. And man, wow. do I know how to pick them or what? Yes, you do. Only the <laughs> most controversial presidents for Monica. No boring bread. No Grover Cleveland's up right. in here, okay, for me. Only, I, I, there's something about these presidents, first of all, brilliant. Secondly, um, masterful communicators, but also underdogs with regard to the deep state. And right. that, that's a conversation for you and me for another day about how the deep state took out Richard Nixon. It's the same deep state that is trying to take out Donald Trump, okay? But I've been so blessed to know these two men. So yes. I feel, and to have worked for them. So I feel um, that I can answer that question this way. Um, back in the 1980s, Donald Trump was a very successful businessman, mm -hmm. right? And he appeared on the Phil Donahue show, back in the day, all right? And Mrs. Nixon happened to be watching that show. And she said to her husband, Dick, you know, I saw Donald Trump on with Phil Donahue. Donahue. He is amazing. And I think if he ever had political ambitions, yeah. he could really go all the way. So President Nixon said, really? And he knew him a little bit from yes. New York, right? So he sat down and he wrote Donald Trump in 1987 a letter that said, Mrs. Nixon saw you on the Donahue show. It's now a famous letter. And should you pursue political office, we have no doubt you will be incredibly successful. Wow. So Donald Trump proudly puts that up. So I think if Richard Nixon were alive to have seen all of this, he would have been 1,000% behind Donald Trump. He would have been supportive of him. Yes. He would have been doing, uh, he would have been advising him yes. behind the scenes as well. Nixon advised all of his successors, yes. by the way, except for Jimmy Carter, but all of the rest of them, Bush won, you know, all of them, Bill Clinton, he gave them tons of advice behind the scenes yes. because he was asked. He would have done the same thing with Donald Trump. They would have gotten along famously. Wow. I, and he would have had all, all respect and admiration for Donald Trump. Yeah, Nick, yeah, Richard, Richard Nixon is the greatest. Like, I do, re so we, we do know that the deep state took Richard Nixon down. Yes. But Richard Nixon, he did something that no other president would do, that no politician would do. And correct me if I'm wrong, but when all this stuff happened with, with Richard Nixon, he he decided to step down, right? So when Watergate happened, he fought it out for about two years from the original uh, burglary in June of 1972 to when he resigned in August of 1974. Mm -hmm. He wanted to continue fighting. His family wanted him to continue to fight. But what pulled the trigger for him was when Republican Senator Barry Goldwater came to the White House and said, look, the de they're going to impeach you, okay? So you're going to be impeached in the House, and then we're going to have to try you in the Senate, and your own party now is no longer supportive of you in the Senate. So it was the Republicans that sort of fell apart on I him in you. the Senate. So he realized he couldn't survive a trial in the Senate if yes. it got that far. And that's when he said, okay, I've got to go. But you know what? These politicians today would have said, well... Let's go at it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Donald Trump has like, survived <laughs> yeah. two impeachments. He's yeah. like, bring it. <laughs> yeah. right? He's like, bring yeah. it. But you know what? I think Richard Nixon wanted the best for this country. Yes. I think he wanted the best for this country. And I wasn't around when he was president, but I have went, but I did watch a bunch of YouTube videos of, of, of like, I watch YouTube videos of Richard Nixon speaking about this and that. Because the things that I heard about Richard Nixon in school were really bad. Yeah. I mean, when I like when, when I was in high school, uh, the, the teachers, they were trash uh, Richard Richard Nixon. They were, I mean, they trashed this man. So I mean, like when I was in school, I thought he was the worst president in the history of America because that's what the teachers would say. Right. Oh, Richard Nixon was a bad man. Richard Nixon was a bad man. But it wasn't until what last year, I just happened to be on YouTube and I said, I saw a Richard Nixon video. I watch the video, and then, you know, when you're on YouTube, you get to watch this stuff. Watch another Richard Nixon video. Oh, this guy's kind of smart. Oh, this guy makes sense. Oh, this guy loved America. Oh, this guy is great. 
I said, those damn teachers lied to me. Yes. They said this was a bad man. Yep. I mean, they were talking about Richard Nixon like he was part of the damn mafia. Yeah. Seriously, that's how they made it out. Like, yeah. that's how they made him out to be, like he was some mafia gangster, you know? Yeah. Like, that's that's how they portrayed him when I was in school, when they would talk about the past presidents. But Richard Nixon, I think if Richard Nixon was living, if he was, I mean... I do think Richard Nixon will vote for President Trump. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I think he will vote for President Trump. Absolutely. If, if, if Richard Nixon was still alive and younger, I mean, I would love to see a Trump-Nixon ticket. <laughs> <laughs> I think Nixon President Trump Nixon would have been, yeah, Nixon-Trump Nixon Trump Trump ticket. Yeah. <laughs> a Nixon-Trump ticket. Now, Monica, listen, I love you, but I, I do have a problem with you, Monica. Uh-oh. What's coming? I, I was on Twitter, and... <sighs> Listen, you put out a tweet, and I almost reported this tweet. Oh, no. I got to read this tweet, y'all. Okay. Monica, mm -hmm. I'm not, listen, I'm against council culture, but I, you need to be counseled after this. <laughs> okay, tell Monica me. Monica said, chicken wings. <laughs> it hurts my heart to even read this because I love you, Monica. <laughs> and, and a lot of people are going to come after you. <laughs> the chicken wing community is coming after you. Uh-oh. You said chicken wings are a waste of time. Thoughts? <laughs> Question mark? Thoughts? Are you, my thought is, are you out of your damn mind? <laughs> what you mean, thoughts? So, can I explain myself? Yes. Okay. Um, you know, because you follow me on Twitter, that my Twitter feed is pure fire. Yes, I put out purifier. a lot of very controversial, purifier. but I just drop truth bombs all over the place, right? That tweet may very well be the most controversial tweet that I have How ever put out. How many people retweeted this? Uh, I don't know. It had like 2,200 likes or something, but it got ratioed because the chicken wing community, as you put it, <laughs> were outraged by my assertion that chicken wings are a waste of time. Let me explain. I put this out on Super Bowl Sunday because I knew everybody was probably going to be eating chicken wings, right? Right, right. I find chicken wings... Um, I, I find them, th this is the kind of food you eat in a dollhouse. In a dollhouse? <laughs> yes. In a dollhouse I, or a doghouse? Doll, D-O-L-L, -L, like everything is miniature, okay? So I have a problem with miniature food. Like, you know, when you go to a Chinese restaurant, you have Chinese food, yeah. those little corns? Are you supposed to eat them like this? Okay. Eat the whole hold, thing? hold on. You okay. got a problem so, with miniature food? I hope you don't got a problem with miniature people because I'm 5'5". Five, five. <laughs> Do you got a problem with me? <laughs> no, oh. I love you. No, it's just miniature food. Yes. There's one exception, pigs in a blanket. I'll have a pigs in a blanket. But chicken wings, here's my issue. Okay. Now, I know when they're done <laughs> right, they're supposedly delicious, and I've had them, and I've had delicious chicken wings. But it is a heck of a lot of work for no meat. There's like no, if first of all, you're eating like this and it's totally, you're like, mm, 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 like the little corns, right? And so you're eating like this and when done right with the sauce, yes. very messy. So now you need white bits or whatever. Um, but you're, you're like putting in all of this effort for like a little tiny shred of meat. And I'm like, what is the point? This is what I mean. This Mom. is a waste of time. Give me, give me a nice piece of fried chicken. Give me a beautiful love grilled fried chicken. chicken breast. Okay. I mean, I, no, I love chicken. I just find chicken wings way too much energy output for the return. Ha, you probably haven't had good chicken wings. I mean, they have to be meaty. There has to be a payoff, Terrence. Meat is meat. Yeah, but on a chicken wing, it's like a little tiny thing of meat. And so you've done all this work and <laughs> there's no meat. Do not diss chicken wings because you don't have the patience <laughs> That's to exactly eat them. Right. I don't have the patience. Okay. I'm like, what? I, and I'm like, oh, come on, man. And then, and then I remember like growing up I, in this, I was always this way with chicken wings. And so my mom would see my plate yeah. and she's like, you didn't eat your wings. I'm like, there's nothing to eat. It's all bone. <laughs> what are you talking about? And the skin, which at the time I didn't want to eat. You didn't so want to eat the skin? She's like, you've left all the meat on the bone. And I go, what meat? There's no, I need a microscope to find the oh, meat. Oh, come on, Monica. You know it's true, Terrence. You wings. owe the chicken wing community an <laughs> apology, Monica. I do not. I was hurt. 
I was devastated. Uh oh. I said, my sister has lost her everlasting mind. Mm -hmm. Actually, I thought it was a fake tweet. I thought it was, I said, did somebody hack Monica's account? <laughs> Somebody go check on Monica. <laughs> I was texting I people. Somebody check on Monica. I think she's been kidnapped. I think someone has her phone. I know. So, okay, so if you are eating chicken wings, okay, let's say you are eating a chicken wing. Yeah. Do you prefer the drum or the flat? Um, The drum because it has more meat on it. I mean, I am a Republican carnivore, yes. okay? I, I eat meat. Yes. I eat red meat, chicken, fish, you name it, right? So if I'm going to put the energy into picking it up and <laughs> like a little typewriter yeah. to yeah. get into the meat, it better be a drum because yeah. the drum is, is more fulsome. So maybe you're right. Maybe I should have clarified in that tweet and said right. the flat chicken wings are a waste of time, but drums are okay. Speaking of, speaking of chicken, I'm... I'm I've been hearing that a lot of chickens are having a hard time laying eggs. What's, what's yes. going on? Have you heard about that? Yes. What's, what's going on with that? We have all kinds of bizarre things happening, right? Train derailments, birds right. falling from the sky. We've also had a very serious a series of like food uh, facilities, food production, right. um, buildings like burning to the ground. And now this chicken thing. So first of all, Eggs are up 70% year over year. 70%. 70%. So in some places in the country, it's 20 bucks for a dozen eggs. So you're paying, you know, more than a dollar per egg. One egg. Nothing fancy. Not a pheasant egg. Wow. Okay? A dollar or per egg. Or a Fabergé egg. egg. I'm talking like regular eggs. Yeah. So in some parts of the country, it's crazy. We don't know what's going on. Food facilities burning down. We got chemicals going into the water. What is happening? Um, but these chickens that apparently are having a hard right. time laying eggs, so it's creating an unnatural shortage. Right. Um, you know, I've seen different farmers being interviewed over the last couple of weeks, and they're saying um, they think it's the feed, that there's something new in the feed that's causing the chickens to stop laying eggs. But well, we got to get this food situation straightened out. I mean, wow. human beings need food and water just as a base baseline survival exactly. thing, right? So with all of this happening, it's very, very dangerous. There's such a weird vibe in the world, right? It is. It is a real, I mean, it was a weird vibe when Joe Biden and Kamala Harris stole the 2020 election. It, the, yeah. it was, it was a weird vibe. It's it was been a weird, a weird vibe, vibe since, since, since yes. then. Actually, since the pandemic. January of 2020. Since the pandemic. Very strange Very, energy. very strange. Do you think, that, like, what is the administration doing about this? Have they even spoken about this? About this problem? Uh, I don't the chicken and egg problem, I have not heard any commentary on, okay? But you've got it in administration that is all there because of DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? right. Including the vice president is there because of that. And affirmative then you, action. Affirmative action. She's an affirmative government. action. Yeah, exactly. Affirmative action government. Right. They and chose, so, yeah. You know, what, Pete Buttigieg is there. Because he checks one particular box. Right. So he's our Secretary of Transportation. We have had a supply chain cr chain crisis. We've had these derailments, all kinds of crazy stuff going right. on, and he is nowhere. I mean, it took Pete Buttigieg 10 days to make a statement about this derailment in Ohio that's spewing toxic chemicals into the air, polluting the, the streams, killing fish, birds falling out of the sky. 10 days. I can just tell you, having been at Treasury- Right. And working with Secretary Mnuchin, I mean, the second there was any kind of sense of any kind of economic problem at all, he was out there. He was on TV. He was out with a statement. I mean, boom. And if five minutes went by without that, the propaganda press was all over me. Right. Where is he? Where is the step? Where is the leadership? Where is it that? But this administration, nobody is qualified for any of these jobs. And so they're all dead silent when this stuff happens. They're all there. They're in these positions, Terrence, as a resume builder. Right. right. Like, oh, hey, I, I was secretary of whatever. Exactly. Right. And they're all headed to CNN and, and MSNBC exactly. when they're done. Exactly right. When they're done. Yeah. Like, Pete, what is his name? Pete Buddha, Buddha, Huda. Buddha, Buddha, Tudor. <laughs> boot Buddha, Edge, Tudor. Edge. Yeah, boot Edge, as Edge. As Trump says. Like, like you said, how did he even get this job? 
Well, you checked a very important box. What box was that? The gay box. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the gay box. Yes, he is, he's openly gay. He has a husband and he checked that box, you know? And then there are women, women of color, men of color. Like, uh, the- what is the press secretary? What's her name? Karine uh, Jean-Pierre. Her, yeah, she, yeah, she gets the job because she's a black lesbian. Yeah, I mean, she's completely unprepared she's for worse, this job. She's worse than Miss Circleback. <laughs> you remember yeah. Chucky? Yeah. You know, uh, what, what's her name? Uh, Jen, Jen Pasaki. Jen Saki. Yeah, Jen Saki. Saki, whatever. I can't remember their names. They got some weird names. I will I will give Saki credit. She was very good at her job. She was. Because, look, it's very easy to be the press secretary for a Democratic president. Yeah. Because the entire press corps in front of you right. is all on your side. Right. And they're just going to, you know, throw you softballs and yeah. no follow-ups and not press you on anything. Right. So it's, I'm not saying it's an easy job, but it's easier than any Republican. Right. Right. president, right. right? She also had been in the Obama administration. Oh. Again, this is Obama's third term. And she had been the State Department spokesperson. So she knew how to work the press. And I think she was very good. She was, it was all lies, yes. but she was very good at what she did. Corinne Jean-Pierre is, uh, and I don't like to call people dumb, but she is literally dumb. And it's one thing to like not have a handle on stuff, but this is why they hand the press secretary a briefing book to study yeah, so that you can bone up on the stuff that you right. don't know about. So when you go in front of the nation and the press corps, you don't look like an imbecile. Right. She goes out and looks like an imbecile every day because she doesn't put the work in. Right. She doesn't care to study. She never knows she- the answer. Because she knows she's never not going to get pressed, right. maybe by uh, Peter Ducey from Fox, and that's that's about it, right? So, and it's Kamala too. Kamala is the vice president of the United States. Oh she God, she does zero prep. She knows nothing and doesn't put in the work, and that's what's infuriating. It's Kamala like, oh, Harris is so, resume builder. Kamala Harris. Uh, I saw a video uh, not too long ago. Kamala Harris was talking about yellow school buses. She's obs- she is obsessed with these school buses. She said. Um, I I just love yellow school buses. <laughs> so uh, they're going to be electric. But guys, don't worry. Uh, it's still going to be yellow. and But the heart of the bus is going to be green. <laughs> what in the uh, hell are you talking about, Kamala? I know. I know. It's so, you know. And she's always trying to come up with some motivational speech. Some motive, like uh, come on. What, what did Kamala say? She said, There is a time where we all have to come together, and when that time comes, we have to come together. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, it's so bad. What? How about the passage of time? Yeah, the what? passage of time. I mean. <laughs> Like, look at this administration, Monica. This is why I can't sleep at night. Yeah, I know. This I is know, why. Me too. No, and I'm, I'm, I'm being serious. Like some, like sometimes I'll just think to myself, like, how did we get here? How did we get here? Like, it, it's I, so sad. It is. Right? It is disturbing. Like, look where this country is headed. It makes me sick to even come up with. It makes me even sick to even for, for this to even come out of my mouth, but. What if Joe Biden wins again? Where do you, how would America look? I know. Um, what position will we be in? It, it, it will be lost. Let me just put it that way. The America that we all know and grew up in and love so much, it will be lost because they are in the process of locking in so that it's irreversible. You know, and it's a multi-pronged war. I mean, this this is not just, oh, and it's also not going to be fixed with one election either. Right. You know, everybody, I mean, Donald Trump, thank goodness we had him when we did, but he was just one man powerful one, strong one, you know, I hope he comes back, but he's, he was only one guy only and he only had man. four years. Keep in mind that what you are seeing now is a tipping point of a very long-term project by the international Marxist movement. Okay. Right. And when I described this, I remember years ago talking about this and Bill O'Reilly laughing at me, what do you mean communists yeah. and socialists? This started in the 1930s as a KGB operation to destroy the United States from within, infiltrate America, grab control over the major pillars of American society and life, 
And they did. So they came in and they grabbed control over education. Mm -hmm. They started at the university level and now they're all the way down to kindergarten. Um, the media, the news media yeah. in particular, and the culture. Movies, television, music. I mean, you know, because you're right. conservative and you're extremely talented. You should be a huge star. But they block you because they have had control over this for decades. Yes. So when the Soviet Union collapsed in the early 1990s, guess what? The CCP out of China stepped in. The Islamists stepped in. You, you've had all of these other dark forces yeah. take over the project. And so what you're seeing now is the tipping point. They've been working on this for 90 years, and now the country is ready to collapse. Right. You know what? I, I use the analogy of termites all the time. If anybody's had a house with termites, you know that the termites burrow in and they start eating at the foundation and the wood yeah. for years. And to the naked eye, the house looks fine. It's standing, it looks pretty, you've painted it, whatever. But the termites keep working, working and working they don't until stop. one day the structure collapses. And I think we're getting very, very close to that right now, Terrence. And if to your question, if Joe Biden is reelected or another left winger, whether it's Michelle Obama or Gavin Newsom or yes. Mrs. Clinton, whatever it might be, this country will be over permanently. There will be no going back. So this is a critical moment for the GOP to make sure that we have ballot harvesting, ballot curing, all of the mechanics of electioneering yes. on the ground now, and that we've got a candidate who can withstand the deep state assault. Who can say that again? Who can withstand the, the deep, deep state, state assault. assault? Not who people think the deep state will let win, because they're not going to let any Republican win. Correct. At and all. That's the point. They're going to get Trump out the way because it's going to be hard to beat him. That's the point. Wow. Yep. Can we survive I until mean, 2024? Uh, yeah, well, that's another question. It's a, it's a miracle this country is still standing over it's the last two years, and that's a testament to our strength. But, you know, there is like a tipping point for every country and every empire, and, and we're getting really close to it. So hope and pray that we can make it through the next two years. Yes. Right. And then hopefully there will be a change. But we need all hands on deck in order to do that. We need voices like yours. We need people on the ground, election watchers, poll watchers. We need everybody who believes in America still to be doing this hard work to save America. Yes, we do. So I take it that in the primaries, you're voting for Trump. Trump is, <laughs> Trump is my friend, and I would never throw him under the bus. Thank and, you. And I've got to tell you, it is infuriating to me to see so many people who served in the Trump administration where President Trump gave them the job of a lifetime, exactly. changed their entire life, watching them throw him under the bus. Like, if you had a problem with the way he governed January 6th, whatever, we can have legitimate debates about that, all that stuff, but keep your mouth shut right. publicly, okay? If you disagreed with whatever, you should have resigned at the time. Exactly. Right? Or now, keep your mouth shut and go about your exactly. business. Exactly. If you have President Trump's number, if you know how to get in contact with Trump, if you know his point of contact, and if you have sat at the table with him, if you have broke bread with Trump, if Trump has helped you, you you don't have to go on Twitter or Facebook and call him out. You could you know how to get in touch with him. If he's really your friend, give him a call, email him, right? Reach out to his point of contact, but do it privately. Do it do it privately, right? And just say, why do you got to take Mr. it to President, social media? You know, I had an issue with the way exactly. you handled January six, and so I really I can't support you publicly anymore, or you know, fund your next campaign, whatever it might be. But you do it in a classy way, in a classy you way, do it privately. Monica, for an example, I love you. You are like my sister. You are yes. my sister. Yes. And when you put out that ridiculous tweet about chicken wings <laughs> are a waste of time, I didn't go on Twitter and call you out. No, but you're calling me out here. I'm calling you podcast. out now. I'm calling you out now. <laughs> face to face. <laughs> well, I can take it. I can take face, it. Face, face to face. Yep. And, you know, and people say, well, you don't have to be loyal to a politician. It's not, I'm, it's not about being loyal to a politician. First of all, I have, uh, I have respect for President Trump. And not only that, I'm not being loyal to Trump. I know that Trump is the one, is the only one that can get this country back on track. 
And that's why I'm voting for President Trump, not just because he's a Republican, not like not just because I sat at the table or took a picture with Trump. No, I'm voting for Trump because he's the one. Yeah. Who 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 else can like you said stand up to the deep state? Yeah, repeatedly. Who can repeatedly who 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 can handle a deep state attack? Yeah. A lot of them will break. Yeah. They wouldn't and, be able to handle it. And that's the point. They wouldn't be able to handle it. The deep state wants a broken president like a Joe Biden who doesn't know what planet he's on most exactly. of the time, right? They like and look at Fetterman too. The the left How did Fetterman win? Well, they they you know, they rigged it to their advantage with ballot harvesting, ballot curing, and all of that. You know, there were 600,000 votes banked for Fetterman before the debate where everybody saw he didn't know what planet he was on, right? Yeah. So the Democrats know how to play the game, and our side is contemplating our navel all the time. Why is that? Of- why, why won't the Republicans play the game, too? The Democrats will not stop playing the game. They know how to win. They know what people want to hear. Why don't the Republicans play the same game so we can get back in and fix this damn country? Yeah, I know. Well, this is why we wanted a change of leadership in the Senate. Mitch McConnell out. Kevin McCarthy, who, thank God for those Patriot 20, who stood up to McCarthy and held back on the Speaker's vote to get those America First concessions. Very important. The House now operates in a totally different way. And Ronna McDaniel at the RNC. I mean, you Golly. cannot, right? Einstein once said the definition of, of insanity is doing the same thing over, over and, and over again. and expecting a different result. There's a reason why the the mantra is the Democrats are the evil party and the Republicans are the stupid party. <laughs> right. Okay? Right. The Democrats completely evil. And now, like I said at the top, you know, a lot of demons making themselves known here. They right? are. Monica, the Republican Party is stupid. Stupid. And they are acting so stupid. It it really hurts me because I want the Republicans to secede because I want America. To, to succeed. succeed, yes. But sometimes I just, I'm like, oh, oh, you guys are so stupid. I don't even want to be a part of this party anymore well, because you know, you're not listening. You're not doing what you need to do so we can win. Because they don't really care. So let me just make a quick point about the uni party. So we think we have two parties in this country, and technically we do, but the, the ruling class is the uni party. Yes. It's the establishment Democrats The establishment Republicans, they don't give a flying wit about you, Terrence, or me, or America First. In fact, they're antagonistic to America First because that throws a big monkey wrench into all of their plans to get themselves more power and more money. All of this is about empowering and enriching them as the ruling class. This is why when Trump came in and said, no, I'm going to blow that all up and I'm going to focus on the forgotten men and women in this country— the American people who actually make this country run every day, right? Right. They couldn't have that. He was blowing the whistle on their entire corrupt gravy train. He blew the whistle on it. He didn't need it. And therefore, yeah. he needs to be destroyed, right? right? So he, they don't care about us or the future of the country. It is it is amazing. They only care about themselves and their own power. And that's exactly why 2024 is going to be... Lit. A shit show. Lit. It's going to be lit, but yes. <laughs> but yes. Gavin Newsom is a liberal's wet dream. They love that guy. <laughs> they do love him. I want to straight do... out of the uh, 50 shades of gray. <laughs> they, they... I want to do a quick little plug for my friend, Joel yes. Gilbert, who makes documentaries and he's done one on Michelle Obama and it's called yeah. Michelle Obama 2024. And it lays out her whole life story and what a fraud she is, especially right. on the racial aspect. Like she's a strong black woman, but she came from middle class outside Chicago and all of it is a fraud. But he really is convinced that she's going to run in 2024. And this is why they've got Joe Biden coming out saying, I'm going to run because they want him to freeze the field. So Mm. Newsom, Hillary, nobody else can make any moves while the incumbent president is running. And then at the last minute, Biden is going to step down and Michelle is going to come riding to the rescue. And if if that's the case, Terrence, we're really screwed because she, to, to my mind, she's the only one who could beat Donald Trump, Ron DeSantis. Any oh, of them. God. I'm not no. saying she will, but I'm saying she could. Oh, Lordy. You know what? That will be a tough race. 
Yeah. That will be a tough race. Yeah. And you are right because they asked Michelle Obama. I saw an interview and they asked Michelle Obama, are you going to vote for Joe Biden? Or do you think Joe Biden should run again? She said, I, I don't know. What you mean you don't know? Right. I thought y'all were all friends. She said she didn't know because she's probably going to run against him. Wow. <laughs> and we better hope and pray Monica, that she doesn't because that'll make our lives much more complicated. Monica, everybody wants to know.